Let's look at uh, first, uh, 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 today. That's our scripture for today. And I want to read these verses, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 4. And we'll use these verses to prepare for the Lord's Supper today. Verse number 1, it says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let's bow together as we pray this morning. Father, we are so thankful for this day and for this new opportunity of worship together as the body of Christ. And Lord, we just come to thank you for the privilege that it is of ours as a people to gather and worship you. Thank you, Lord, for what you did for us on the cross so long ago and for all that that means in our lives, even right down to this very morning. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity of participating together in the Lord's Supper. Pray that you bless this part of the service in a very special way. Pray, Father, for the singing of the hymns, for the preaching of your word, and that our hearts might be challenged and even changed by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in this place. Thank you for this fellowship of believers. Thank you for all that you're doing through Olive Branch Church. Thank you for our Sunday school, for the wonderful attendance, for the way that's growing. Thank you for our teachers. And we pray that you just continue to give us direction and guidance and vision for the future in Sunday school as well as in the ministries of the church here. Again, we thank you most especially for your son Jesus, and for the sacrifice that he made for our sins, that we might have eternal life and salvation through him. And we ask that you help us as we celebrate that in this service today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I ask you, if you will, to open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verses 1 through 4 today as we uh, bring a message, uh, not in the book of Acts as we've been for weeks, but uh, we're taking a little, uh, little step aside from that this morning as we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper. And I wanted to bring a message today that sort of focuses on that and prepares us for uh, coming to the Lord's Supper uh, in a few minutes. And... Uh, the, the title of the message today is, Oh, What a Difference. Oh, What a Difference. And what I want you to see and understand as we go through the service today is that the Lord's Supper and the elements that are represented on this table make a difference in the life of the person that's affected by it. And so uh, when we come in a few minutes to uh, uncover this table and, and these elements of the Lord's Supper are passed out, uh, it should have made a difference and it ought to make a difference in your life. When you reach to take that wafer and drink that cup, there is a difference that is made because of the work that Jesus Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. So we want to talk a little bit about that uh, in the message this morning. In fact, that's what uh, these verses in First Peter or Second Peter chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 talk about. It talks about transformation. It talks about change that the Lord Jesus brings in our lives. And that's what this table is a symbol of. It's a symbol of the transformation and the change that Jesus Christ brings in a person's life. That's really the key thought or the idea that runs along through the message today. And that is that transformation and change are a natural part of the Christian life. It just ought to naturally be taking place in your life transformation, change, God doing things in your life, working new experiences into your heart ought to be the natural byproduct of knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior and that's what this table represents. It represents transformation and change. 
There are a lot of kinds of stories about transformation and change that you can find today. I, I, I stumbled across one that uh, I had never read. I read a lot, but I'd never read this story. It sort of fascinated me, and I really didn't understand the true impact of the story until I got right at the very end of the story. As Paul Harvey would say, then you got the rest of the story at the very end of it. A little guy by the name of Joey Barra. Uh, he, uh, he went to school as all children do, but he was sort of, he was sort of, I guess we would say today, bullied by the other uh, students at school. He was made fun of. He was laughed at. And, and particularly uh, in, as he got into high school when his mother wanted him to take violin lessons. She, uh, she uh, you know, sensed that there was a talent there, and so she, uh, uh, she uh, worked hard to scrounge up the money for his violin lessons, and she uh, would uh, send him off for violin lessons. And, of course, when the students at school, you know, found out about it, they made fun of him because, uh, you know, he was a boy and he was playing the violin, and maybe today that wouldn't be as big a deal, but way back then it was a pretty big deal, I guess. And, and, uh, and one day he just had had about all of it he could stand and he just busted that violin over another kid's head. But it didn't, it didn't help anything. They just laughed at him all the more and they bullied him all the more. But he had a friend by the name of Thurston McKinney. And Thurston McKinney sort of took Joey Barrow under his wing and uh, told him, he said, you know, maybe you need to do some other things. Why don't you come go with me and, and, uh, and let's, I work out every day down at the gym. And so... Uh, uh, Joey Barra went with his friend Thurston McKinney down to the gym, and uh, and and Thurston told him. He said, "Now the only thing is, is you got to uh, you've got to uh, you got to rent a locker in order to work out down here, and a locker back then was fifty cents." And uh, he said, "Well, I don't know where I'm gonna come up with the fifty cents to get the locker." And then he thought, "Well, hey, I'll just use those uh, the money that Mama's giving me from my violin lessons to rent the locker," and that's what he did. Put his violin in the locker. Uh, got some old uh, uh, gym shorts and stuff from Thurston and some old shoes and started working out every afternoon down at the gym. Uh, finally, after a, a period of time, Thurston asked Joey Barry, he said to him, said, Joey, said, what about just sparring with me a little bit in, in the ring? And, uh, and he did. He, he was willing to do it. He put the gloves on. He got in the ring and sparred with his friend. And, and, and keep in mind that Thurston McKinney was a Detroit Golden Ju Gloves champion. And that afternoon, for the first time ever, Joey Barra sparred with his friend Thurston McKinney and clobbered him. I mean, just flattened him. And when it was all over with, Thurston said to his friend, Joey said, man, you really need to put the violin down and step in the ring. And he did. He changed his name. Dropped the bearer off of his name because he didn't want his mama to know what he was doing because he knew what she'd do to him if she found out. And after a few fights, he was, he was really good. And so he really did change his name up a little bit then because he didn't want the, his mama to read in the newspapers about his son who uh, uh, made it to 23 at that time and, and would become a heavyweight boxing champion of the world. He dropped his name from Joey Barra. And the Joey Barra was transformed from the sissy that they made fun of at school to the heavyweight champion boxing Joe Lewis. There was a major transformation from the Joey Barra to the Joe Lewis. And when you open 2 Peter, right off the bat, very first words in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, you see an amazing transformation. It isn't the transformation of a sissy to a prize fighter. It's the transformation of a common ordinary man to becoming a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. Notice how Peter introduces this book in verse number 1. He introduces it by saying what? Simon Peter. That's, that's significant. I circle that in my Bible. That's significant. And here's why it's significant. It's significant because... He introduces this book different from the way he introduced 1 Peter. If you go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he just starts out, Peter. But in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Simon Peter. So I gotta believe there's a reason for that, right? I gotta believe there's a reason why the Holy Spirit put those words there, and here's the reason. 
The reason is God wants you to see the transformation and the change and the difference that he makes in a person's life when they surrender to him. Simon Peter. Simon, that's who he was before Jesus Christ came into his life, right? That, that, that was his name before Jesus. Simon. The, 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 the word Simon, the name Simon means shifting. In other words, kind of like the sand. It'll just kind of, when you step on it, it'll just kind of move out from under your feet. That's the kind of life Simon was living before Jesus. But remember what Jesus said to him in Matthew 16? Your name is Simon, but your name is going to be called Peter, which is a rock. You see, Jesus saw potential and possibility in the life of Peter, and that's why he changed his name from just simple old Simon, shifting, moving around, not, not, no stability whatsoever to a man who is going to become a rock. It was an amazing transformation. And he becomes, notice, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. He becomes a faithful servant of the Lord Jesus Christ because of the transformation and the change that Christ brought in his life. And so I want you to look at this passage and I want you to think about it in relationship to the Lord's Supper because what Jesus does in a person's life, as we're going to see here, what he does in your life and my life, Peter's life, it represents something at this table. In fact, there are three things that this table to me this morning represents. And so when we come to it in a few minutes, I hope you just be able to remember these three things. Three things this table represents. Number one, this table represents a divine person. It represents a divine person. I mean, we're talking about the body and we're talking about the blood. That's what we're talking about in the wafer and in the cup. It points us, it represents the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it represents a divine person. You notice in, in these uh, first two verses how many times he, he talks about Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of who? Jesus Christ. Then look at verse 2. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of God and Savior, who? Jesus Christ. Verse number 2 says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So you see it? This table represents a divine person. Salvation is about accepting a divine person into your life. Now let me tell you two precious things about our salvation this morning. Number one, in this passage, I notice two things about our salvation. So when I, when I come to the table in a little bit, I want, to, I want to remember these things. That I have the privilege of coming to this table because of a divine person who came on my behalf. And he was divine because you notice it talks about the righteousness the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. So he was divine. He was a divine person. And he, this divine person is what brings salvation to me. And two things about it I want you to notice. Number one is, is, is the, the sweetness of salvation. The sweetness of salvation. You notice what he says in verse number two? He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He talks about the sweetness of it. Two words I want you to circle, grace and peace. And those words, those words describe to me the sweetness of the salvation experience. Grace. Let's think about that for a second. Grace. Why does a person need grace? Why do you need grace? Why do I need grace today? Every person needs grace because every person has a problem. And at, you know what that problem is? Every person has a problem with God. Yes, you've got a problem with God. You know what that problem is? Sin. Sin. Sin separates people from God. And so every, every man, every woman, every person has a problem with God. So you know what you need? You need grace in order to solve the problem that you have with God. But not only do we need grace, but we also need peace. You see, not only do we have a problem with God, and we need grace to solve the sin problem. But we also have a problem with ourselves. And because of that, we have a problem with others. That's why we need peace. You see, grace and peace takes care of the problem with God. Sin separates us from Him. 
But also peace helps us with ourselves, therefore it helps us in our relationships with others. Sin tears everything apart. You ever notice that? Sin rips things apart. Sin rips people apart. Sin rips relationships apart. Sin rips churches apart. Sin just pulls things apart. But Jesus is in the business of bringing things back together. Jesus is in the business of producing peace and providing peace for us. So you see the sweetness of salvation. When I come to the table this morning, I'm going to remember I'm standing where I'll be standing. You'll be seated where you'll be seated because of divine person and the sweetness that he's brought into our lives. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. But I want you to watch not only here the sweetness of it, I want you to notice also the sureness of it. Notice the sureness of it. Notice what he says. I, I love this phrase in verse number 1. Ta he, Peter introduces himself. And then he says, To those who have obtained, notice the next phrase, like precious faith. Like precious faith. There's the sureness of where we'll stand and sit this morning as we come to the Lord's table. Like precious faith. That's an interesting phrase. The word literally means... The same in equality and value. So in other words, what Peter is saying is, the same faith that saved me, that's the kind of faith that saved you. It's like precious faith. See, an interesting thing about God's salvation, and it's, fa it's fair to any and it's fair to all. It's, it's, just, it's just laid right out there, fair to any and fair to all. Any and all can come to Christ the same way. It's by faith. Now your experience may be different, what you feel may be different, what happens in your life may be different according to you know, what's been going on in your life. But look, it's like precious faith. The, the, the faith that saved Peter, that kind of faith in Jesus Christ, that, that's how I came to Christ. I just put faith in the same Christ that Peter put faith in and I came to it. That's the sureness of our salvation. It's all wrapped up in a divine person. So when you come to the table this morning, I want you to remember a divine person. You reach and take that wafer, get that cup. It's because a divine person offered his life for you that you might have the righteousness of God imputed to you, given to you, marked up on your account, credited to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. It represents a divine person. But I want you to notice number two, that this table not only represents a divine person, this table number two also represents a divine power. Notice what he says in verse number three. In verse number three he says, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. It is a divine power. It represents a divine power. In other words, I couldn't have got to where I am today on my own. That's what I'm trying to say to you. I could have never gotten to where I am this morning on my own. I could have never uh, uh, obtained salvation on my own. That was something that Jesus Christ did for me. He, he, he gave me the power. You know, I, I talked to a lot of people about being saved and trusting Christ. You know, the biggest thing I, I, I have people say to me, uh, well, preacher, I just, I'm afraid I can't live it. You ever heard that? Ever had anybody say, I just, I just don't, I'm afraid I can't live it. I don't want to be a hypocrite and, and I'm going to just wait till I can live it. You know what I always say? Well, you're just going to die and go to hell. You just, I, I mean, simply put, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just saying you're just going to die and go to hell. If you wait till you can live it before you come to Jesus, you're going to die and go to hell. Because I'm, i got news for you. This verse of Scripture right here teaches us that none of us in this room can live it unless we trust in the power of the divine person who died on the cross for our salvation in the first place. Not, not only do I by faith have to trust Him, man, I by faith have to trust Him to every day of my life live the life that He wants me to live. But I notice this divine power. I want you to notice two things about this divine power. I want you to notice, number one, <clears throat> it is a calling power. Notice it is a calling power. Notice what he said down at the latter part of this verse. He said, As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who did what? Who called us? Who called us? Hey, how did I get saved? God called me. Holy Spirit of God drew me. In fact, you can't get saved any other way. 
You realize that tonight? Holy Spirit of God doesn't go to work in your life. Holy Spirit of God doesn't bring conviction. You, 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 can't, you won't even know you got a need to come to Christ. But the Holy Spirit of God does draw people. And the Holy Spirit of God does work in the lives of people. And God does call people. Why, why did God send His Son Jesus into the world the way He did to do what He did? To call people unto Him. In fact, the drawing power of a church, and sometimes churches miss this, the drawing power of a church, it isn't the preacher, it isn't the leadership, Man, the drawing power of the church is Jesus Christ, the divine person himself. And if we ever get our eyes in any other direction, then that's why nothing will ever happen. But when we lift Jesus Christ up, he gave us a promise. I will draw people not to the preacher, not to the deacon. I'll draw people unto me. And people get saved when that happens. And people's lives are transformed when that happens happens. You see, it's a divine person, a divine power has been given when we trust Christ and it calls us, it draws us. Hey, something drew Simon Peter, didn't it? Something drew Peter and Andrew and all those guys to leave their nets and their boats and to follow something that they saw in Jesus Christ. And the way I always put it, if I can just somehow or another, through the help of the Holy Spirit, get people to see how wonderful Jesus is, They'll turn that junk out there in the world loose and come running to Jesus. It's just, it's just that you just get people to see how wonderful Jesus is. That's when they start letting stuff go and they start coming to Jesus because they realize how precious he really is. It's a calling power. But not only is it a calling power, I want you to notice that it is a changing power. It is a changing power. Now don't miss this. This is so important. This verse right here is so important. So you ought to remember this verse in, in, in helping people who are struggling with stuff. Look at what he says in verse number 3. I want to read it again. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain, I want you to look at a couple of phrases here, that pertain to what? To life and what? Godliness. Now let's just look at those life and godliness. And I believe they ought to be taken in that order. Life and godliness. In fact, think about it. Here's what this divine power does. This divine power gives you life. It gives you life. You say, oh, well now, I've been living, preacher. No, you've just been existing. You don't really live until you come to Jesus Christ. And when you come to Jesus Christ, that's when you really live. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, I came to give them what? Life. I came to give people life, John 10.10, 10, and it more what? Abundantly. So, look, here it is right here. People say, oh, I, 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 I don't know if I can live it. Well, the truth is, without the power of God, you can't live it. Without the power of God, you can't be what you ought to be. But with the power of God, guess what? He gives you life. He wakes you up. The Bible says in Ephesians 2 that we were dead in trespasses and sins, but something happened when Jesus came in. He rose us up. Rose us up out of the deadness of sin in the life. Watch this now. Life and what? Godliness. Life and godliness. You see, the Christian life, I started it out. Change and transformation. Transformation and change are the natural part. It's just a natural part of the Christian life. If this divine power is flowing through you, then naturally, it's, it gives you life, but it also gives you what you need to live a godly life in this world right here. In fact, notice the word that he used here in verse 3. As his divine power has given to us, watch this now, what? All things that pertain to life and godliness. Now what does that mean? It's real simple. Everything that you need to be what God wants you to be as a believer, you got it when you got saved. You got it. You got it. It came. Now sometimes you see these, these athletes today and they have tremendous potential. They have unbelievable talent. They, could just, they, they can do unbelievable things, catch the ball in unbelievable ways, make moves that, that you just wouldn't believe an athlete could make. And yet, some of them never write. You know, they talk about five stars and four stars. And I always talk about how many five stars Alabama's got, how many five stars Ohio State got and all that. Hey, all them stars don't make a 
difference in the world if a player don't live up to the potential of what the star said. Isn't that right? I mean, you see some athletes, they're lazy, they slouch around, and, and they, they don't show up, they're not on time, you know. I work with a football team in Greenville, and man, you know, I, I, I can all, after, after about two times of being around them, I can tell you which ones are going to do and which one's not going to do. I can, just by how they come in, and, and, and whether or not they're on time or they're not on time, and all this, you, you just go on. It's, it's not the big things, it's the little things that sink us. And guess what? In the Christian faith, it isn't the big things, it's the little things. It's the tiny little things that we overlook today and overlook tomorrow and forget this, forget that. Next thing you know, those things sink us. But everything we need, God's given us. All things that pertain to the life and godliness of the Christian life, we've given. So when I come to the table, I'm going to remind, hey, look, I'm here because of a divine person, Jesus Christ. And I have a like precious faith. All of us have a like precious faith. And we have grace and peace. I'm here because of a divine power. It's the power of God that enables me to be what God wants me to be or enables us to do the same. But I want you to think about this last thing. This table also represents not only a divine person and a divine power, but number three, it represents divine promises. Divine promises. Notice what he says in verse number four. He says, By which have been given to us exceeding great in other words, he doesn't just say, God gave you some promises. The way I like to put it is, 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 is uh, the writer here, Peter, he piles up words. That's the way I like to put it. He, pi he stacks up words. Sometimes when you read your Bible, the writers, they'll just stack words up on top of one another to try to help you understand how good you, what you have is. And, and that's what Peter does. He just piles words up. He says, has given us not just promises, he says exceeding, great, and precious. You see the words? He's just stacking them up on top of one another. Exceeding great precious promises. That's what God's given us. Promises. Promises. And all through the Bible, there are promises. And he's given us a promise right here. And I don't want you to miss this. And we're going to wrap this up and come to the table. But I don't want you to miss this right here. This promise pertains to salvation. Right here. He says, which, he, which is given to us exceeding great and precious promises. Watch this. That through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. When I come to the table today, I have to pack down my shout to keep it from coming out. I will. I just have to pack it down. You know why? Because this table represents... Two precious things. It represents, number one, everybody that takes the wafer and drinks the cup, it represents the fact that we escape. We, well, you notice what he said? We get to escape corruption. See the word corruption there? In verse number four, he says, By which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these we might be partakers of the divine nature. We'll talk about that in just a second. Having done what? Escaped the corruption. Now that word corruption carries the idea of decay. It's almost like the picture of something dead that's decaying. It's just, it's just rotting away, for lack of a better term. It's just rotting away. In fact, Paul said we're, over there in 1 Corinthians 15, he said we're sold, what? In corruption. But we're raised in what? In incorruption. There's a, there, there, there's a tremendous transformation one of these days that's going to occur. It hadn't occurred yet, but it's going to occur. But notice, we get to escape this, this corruption, this, this moral decay that's going on. Hey, can't you just look around? Can't you look around and tell that there's decay going on in, in America? In fact, I had, a, I had a guy that, he's been a Christian for a long time, and I've been praying for him ever since I heard you make this statement. Before too long, he and I are going to have a conversation because I feel like we need to have a conversation because, you know, uh, we... I was talking about the family, and he, and he looked at me and said, are we really in that bad a shape in America, in the family? And I thought, hmm, I need to have a... It was in public that that statement was made, so I, I left it at that. But in private, I need to have a conversation, don't you think? Because if you can't look around and tell that we're in trouble in the family in America, and you've been in the church for all these years, then we do need to sit down and have a conversation. Because guess what? We've got, we got a problem in America, do we not? 
We have a problem with a family in America. We do have that. There's more, you, you can just see it. There's corruption. There's decay. But here's the truth. Coming to this table means, guess what? We can escape that. We, we can escape through the lust, he says. Corruption that comes through the lust. See, lust is kind of like the bait. That's, see, the corruption, that's on the outside. That's what you see happening. But lust, that's on the inside. That, that's kind of like the bait on the end of the line. You know, that, that's lust. That's the bait. And Satan knows the bait, don't he? He knows what bait to use. You go fishing, you got a bait. But, and the bait looks pretty good, you know. You may have all them different kind of baits and different colors, and they got them sparkly things all over them, you know. And that stuff's just moving through the water, and little Mr. Bass, you know. But when he gets the bait, he gets what? He gets the hook. And you know what? America has been hooked. We have in so many ways it's been hooked. But you see, this table is representative of the fact that, guess what? A transformation and change can occur. And we can escape that. God can set us free. He's the only one who can. But he can set us free. And you notice it. I don't know, this really excites me. You notice he said that through these exceeding great and precious promises that we have, we not only get to escape, but we also get to experience. What? He says we become partakers. What, what's this? Partakers of what? Divine nature. Isn't that something? Man, if you just go off somewhere and get alone all by yourself and ponder that for a little bit, that deep down inside us, salvation brought a divine, special nature. A part of Christ lives within every one of us. And that's what this table represents. It represents the fact that a divine person loved us enough to come for us and call us out. It represents a divine power that changes and transforms our lives. And it represents divine promises that have been given to us. Promises that allow us to escape. Hey, the Bible says that for every temptation, He's made, 1 Corinthians 10, He's made a way of escape. He's, he's cut you a path to get out. If you'll trust Him and His power, not yours, and follow Him. And that's what this table represents to me today divine person, a divine power, and divine promises. Would you bow together with me for just a moment? Heads bowed as we get ready for invitation today. And if you're here today and there's a decision that you need to make before we come to the Lord's Supper, I want to encourage you to make that decision today. Just a moment, we're going to stand and sing our hymn of invitation. And if you're here and you need to trust Christ as personal Savior. You need to invite Him into your life. Perhaps He's been calling you and, 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 and nudging you, the Holy Spirit of God working deep within to draw you to make that step and to take that step of faith. It's like precious faith. Come to Christ. In just a moment, I'm going to encourage you to, to do that as I'll be standing and waiting. If you're here and you need to just rededicate, recommit your life, we want to give you an opportunity to do that. Before we come to the table today, these next moments are an opportunity for us to make sure that everything is clear and right between us and the Lord before we come to the table. Father, thank you so much for what you provided for us and for what this table represents today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of invitation is 183. Hymn 183. Only trust Him. Would you stand with me as we sing just a stanza of this? So if there's a decision or commitment that you need to make, I want to encourage you to come on right now as we begin even to sing this great, great old hymn, Only Trust Him, 183.